one of the deeply challenging outcomes of, of thinking of the, the mind autoaggressively is that it really kind of destroys this, this no, the, the common sense notion of, of a memory. And it's so deeply entrenched in us when I think, you know, what, is, what does your mother look like? Um, what did you do last summer? We qualitatively have this experience of we, we're, we're calling something and somebody brings it to us and it shows up in our mind. But it's, it's already there. The, the image of your mother um, or some sort of video of you know, splashing through the waves. These are recalled and we sit and watch them like and sort of passively. But that's not what's actually happening. What's happening is we have this, as I say, uh, we, we have this capability, this, we have this engine that's able in the moment to generate that image of your mother on command with you know, the, the appropriate input. You say, hey, visual imagery system, give me an image of my mom, and it generates it in that moment. But that image doesn't exist anywhere in the system. It's not there. It's not in your brain. Even if I could completely decode your brain, unless I was able to run it with that input, the image isn't really there. And so memories in some ways aren't real. They're not uh, the things that we kind of intuitively feel that they are. But at the same time, they're very real in the sense that we can generate them on, on demand. Sometimes these are memories that we cherish uh, these are things that we want to be able to pull out of our kind of mental time capsule and look at it again. And the idea isn't that your, your mom's face is forever lost um, and it, it isn't really there, it's an illusion. It's that the ability to generate that is what it means to remember what your mom's face is. Yeah. Now you can picture your mother uh, not just in you know, a single uh, kind of front facing, uh, but picture from the side, picture her uh, making you breakfast as a little kid. You can do whatever you want with this because it has this, this kind of endless potentiation. But this kind of raises the question, okay, thinking about it this way, thinking about memory this way, what if there are, what if there are memories that I want to be able to generate later? Uh, or a better way to put it, it's not a memory I want to be able to generate, but what if, what if I want to have certain kind of generative abilities later on? Instead of thinking of it, how do I store something now that I can later retrieve? It's how can I ensure that I'm going to be able to pull it up on demand later on? And so let's say there's something that's really important to you, it's really precious, really valuable to remember. Is there a way to encode that so that you have a hard probability of being able to, be able to later generate it? Now, of course, we, we know that there's a vast literature on this. It's, there's a, there is a substantive, empirical, scientifically uh, established literature on how to encode information such that you can later remember. It's, it's the, basically the entire field of, of learning. Uh, how do we learn information such that we're later, later, better, later able to retrieve it? But the characterization, thinking about how information actually is encoded and then later used has almost certainly dramatically influenced the way that this field evolved. So many of its findings, of course, are going to be valid. If, if you learn better under some circumstance, one circumstance for the other, and we can measure that in later job performance, later academic performance, that's real. I'm not suggesting that uh, all of the tools that have been designed are no longer valid. But what I am suggesting is that there may be other kinds of tools, other kinds of frameworks that are sitting right in front of us that may be obvious if we think about memory in this other way, if we think of it as a generative process rather than as a retrieval process. So that's something I think I'd also like to explore going forward in a research framework. And what does that look like? Uh, what does it mean to, to think of, of memory uh, not as a, as a storage retrieval process, but as a generative process. How does that change how we educate? As, as, how does it change how we ourselves uh, 
come into contact with and, and digest and process information um, and feed it to ourselves. And maybe also, how do, what can we do in our minds? Uh, what sort of cognitive uh, kind of frameworks that we can actually induce uh, autonomously, uh, you know, autonomically, or in, internally, might be available to us thinking about processes this way because it's a much more dynamic thing. If you're thinking about how do we just store information, well, we can dress up the information in certain ways, we can package it, we can organize it. Um, that means once it gets in there, you're done, and you know, hopefully you'll remember it later on. But if, in fact, what we're talking about is a, a much more continuous generative process, then there may be far more actual tools and points of intervention at our disposal uh, than thinking about it simply in terms of cold storage and retrieval. Something to think about, something to remember. Uh, thanks for listening. This is uh, Elon Baronholtz. Uh, you can find me on Substack at Generative Brain, uh, also at Baronholtz.ai, and I'm on Twitter at Elon Baronholtz.